Welcome back one and all to a new show, a new week. I'm John Derola. We have resumed the natural order of things. Fantastic Mondays are here once again. Francesca Fiorentini, how was your weekend? Oh, it was just busy, lots of work, you know. I, I somehow yeah. decided to do a show on a Sunday, so. That's a um, decision you made and you've stuck with it against all reason. I, I, I yes. That. No, 100%. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that offline another time. <laughs> yeah, she is so committed to destroying the very concept of the weekend that she refuses to take a day off. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Anyway. I don't like his music, I don't like anything about him. Nope, not a fan, the blood weirds mm-hmm. me out. Anyway, uh, hello everyone and welcome back to the show. A full week here at the Damage Board, a full show at the Damage Board, because we have got a ton to talk about today. Not only some new legal pressure on members, uh, of the Trump family in a massive anti-vax rally with some absolutely insane things being said. But we've got impending Supreme Court action. And we also have, there's chaos in the universe. <laughs> we also have a, a fairly supersized meanwhile in. So we're gonna be giving you news updates from around the world on things like, uh, what do we got? We got a. Uh, legal developments for Julian Assange, cryptocurrency having a hell of a week, and a little inside look into a mansion that supposedly cost $1.3 billion to build. Who owns it? No, it's not Elon Musk, actually. Although, oddly enough, he could build hundreds of those. Isn't it a weird world we live in? Anyway, um, with that said, everyone, hit the like button, share the stream. We got a lot we're to be talking about. Are you ready to jump into it, Francesca? Yes, but I have a quick announcement to make. What is that? Can I plug something before we start? <laughs> I have never allowed you to and I don't intend to start now. Okay, well, what's the plug? <laughs> I'm gonna be in New York, I'm gonna be in Brooklyn on March 10th. On Thursday, March 10th, you guys come and see the Bituation Room live, which is my podcast. And also John Iderol is gonna be on the show on Sunday. So you have to watch on Sunday, but uh, I'll be in at the Bell House. You guys can get tickets there, get nice. tickets in my bio. And and this is really quick because because we've got news. but. I've got we news do, too. we do, but that's important news too. Very exciting, everyone go check that out. And also check out this, which I like to call the news. Some members of Donald Trump's family, including Ivanka herself, are now under increased legal threat coming from multiple directions simultaneously. And Donald Trump is not a big fan of that. So let's start off. With the January 6th commission, which sent a letter to Ivanka Trump requesting her, in their words, voluntary cooperation about, quote, a wide range of critical topics related to the Capitol riot. The letter said the lawmakers want to discuss conversations she witnessed or participated in relating to the president's plan to obstruct or impede the counting of electoral votes. So it is not difficult to figure out what it is that they're referring to there. We know earlier this month, The committee's vice chair, Representative Liz Cheney, told ABC News that the committee quote, had firsthand testimony that his daughter Ivanka went in at least twice to ask Trump to please stop the violence. Live on the 6th, he's watching it, he's eating popcorn, he's laughing at all the worst moments. She tried to stop it, supposedly. On the day of the riot, she released a statement saying, the violence must stop immediately, please be peaceful. And so, Is that true? Did that actually happen? What did he say in response? What were other people in the room saying? She knows and because they asked for her voluntary cooperation, I am sure that that will be forthcoming, Francesca. I guess I think the craziest part about all of this to me and the fact that someone like Ivanka would release a statement and that we know that people like Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram and other folks at Fox News were furiously texting Mark Meadows on the day and like, oh, you gotta stop this, you gotta call it off. Like, buddies, didn't you know this was going to happen? I guess you were on the outs of this because a lot of people knew it was going down and including sitting Congress people knew it was going down. Everyone in the White House knew it was going down. So it seems like their attempts to like quell the violence were were like, you know, in earnest, like that they didn't think it would get this bad. It's like, yeah, it Mm -hmm. was supposed to get this bad. Yeah, the idea, well, it it was supposed to get as bad as was necessary for their fever dream to come true, basically. Well, um, they're not gonna get her voluntary cooperation. That's a bold prediction coming from me. But even before we know what she will end up saying, Donald Trump is not happy about this. Not happy that they are trying to talk to members of his family. 
He said in response to this, they're using whatever powers they have. They couldn't care less, they're vicious people. It's a very unfair situation for my children, very, very unfair. It's a disgrace what's going on. They're using these things to try and get people's minds off how incompetently our country is being run and they don't care, they'll go after children. As HuffPost very um, helpfully makes clear, Ivanka Trump is not actually a child. She is in fact a 40 year old adult woman with children of her own. And I, I you know, it's almost endearing. He still mm-hmm. sees them as children, despite the fact um, that she was a White House aide, apparently with at least some level of security clearance. His other adult failed children uh, run his business insofar mm-hmm. as it is a business. Um, so at some point, I think, yeah, they can try to talk to them. If you don't want them, if you don't want children to be involved, why did you involve them in your business and the presidency? Yeah, they, they, I mean, it's an interesting angle, like well played. You're sort of, uh, you know, whispering to the Q people when you just mention children, mm-hmm. uh, you know, save the children. The poor actual Save the Children Foundation is like, God damn it, what are we changing our name to? Um, but then also, <laughs> like, oh, going after family. Republicans love to talk about how dare you bring my family into this. Like, you brought your family into this. They were your White House staff, as you mentioned. So they're pretty much in. In fact, you yeah. brought them into all of your your financial crimes as well with the Trump Organization. So, you know, yeah. I mean, look, rich people bring their uh fi- their their kids into their financial crimes. Um, this is like you know uh what working class people when they like run out their kids' credit or something like that. You know, it's the same thing, but uh, on a yeah. giant level and probably will never be held accountable for. At the very least, look, you're, you're right to point out the hypocrisy that he involved his children. But at least he's never made it personal about other people's children. You would have to look very hard to find an instance of Donald Trump doing that. Well, not look, you'd have to hunt really hard. You'd have to hunter really hard to find an instance <laughs> where he brought up someone else's children. You know, like in press conferences, in rallies, on the debate stage live. You'd have to hunter very hard to identify that. I don't think you would, honestly. Mm-mm. Anyway, if this entire situation doesn't feel succession-y enough, it's about to get succession Because Donald Trump's former lawyer and fixer Michael Cohen claimed that Trump said at one point that if one of his kids had to go to prison over the family business to make sure it was Don Jr., not Ivanka. That is, no, spoiler alerts, that's a scene from the show. But anyway, um, he said specifically, and Donald (laughs) said it to me. I mean, I wouldn't say it if it wasn't said directly to me. He goes, if one of the other has to go to prison, make sure that it's Don, because Don would be able to handle it. (laughs) And uh, what what do you 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 know, You know, Eric is there, you know, it's like neither Don nor (laughs) nor Ivanka and Eric's there like, dad, just so you know, I am willing to go to prison for however long. I mean, honestly, (laughs) 40 years, let's do it. Like that's mm-hmm. how much I love you, and and I'll assume I'll get promoted, but eventually it doesn't even matter. Like decades, I'll go. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> big Tom energy. <laughs> that's that. That's pretty good. Yeah, I no, I, I doubt that that's happening. And could he handle it better? I mean, I I don't think Ivanka would do very well in a real prison, but neither would Don Jr. And let's. Let's keep it real, they're never, first of all, they're never going to literally any prison. So again, while these updates can be fun and interesting, and I'm glad that committees are doing the work they're supposed to do, nothing will ever happen because America is a failed state. But even if they were to go to prison, they're not going to serious prison. They're going to a prison that will have nicer amenities than literally any vacation I have ever gone on or will ever go on. I feel very confident in that. Oh, anyway. I think Don Jr. would like it. He'd be like, "Oh, thank God, pressure is off. I've got all these cameos to fulfill. I'm doing all That's these true. recordings for 50 bucks a pop." Oh God! Um, <laughs> Take my phone away from me, please. Come on, Don Jr. Even even Rudy gets 400. Um, but anyway, yeah, he he might depend. How he'll do is going to really come down to how accessible white powder is in that particular prison. Anyway, um, now. This, those past quotes by Michael Cohen might make it seem as if uh, Trump is willing to throw Don Jr. overboard. But he does at least seem to have this affection for Ivanka, various forms of affection, some of them appropriate, others not so much. Um, But it turns out, at least according to Michael Cohen, and bear in mind, whenever we give you quotes from Michael Cohen, remember that he's 
an awful person who works for awful people. And there's literally no reason to believe a word that he says. He says he believes there is quote, not a chance that the former president would offer to cooperate with investigators to shield even his daughter from her legal troubles. And I so mean, apparently ready, what? you know. Michael Cohen did jump ship though. Like I understand that like most people who've worked in Trump's inner circle have like we should not believe a single word they say, but if there's one person, now granted I'm not going to buy his book, but if there's one person, it's the guy who's got nothing left to lose, which is Michael Cohen who's already serving a 3-year federal prison sentence for the admission of the crimes that he did for Donald Trump. Trump should be the one serving that time, but he's not. So it's like when you got someone who's got nothing left to lose, I'm like, yeah, listen to that guy. The fixer, Trump's fixer for decades. Yeah, listen to that guy. So if he exactly. says nothing's gonna happen, then John, I think our suspicions are correct. Yeah, I think so. But by the way, as I alluded to at the beginning, the January 6th commission, them wanting to talk to Ivanka and other members of the family, that is but one aspect of the, in the end, likely ineffectual attempt to have some sort of consequences for the Trumps. Additionally, New York AG Letitia James has said that her investigations into the Trump organization has uncovered significant evidence of fraudulent and misleading asset valuations. That's a story we talked about last week on the show. James has taken legal action to enforce subpoenas issued to Donald Trump and his children, Don Jr. and Ivanka. Who she says were uh, quote closely involved in the transactions in question, which theoretically at least seems like well that's a little bit more likely to result in some sort of legal action. A lot of the stuff has got to be documented. She seems very confident about it. This isn't just conversations. This is demonstrable financial crimes. But again, it's America. So what do we think is going to come of that? Will any of this prevent him from being able to run again? That's really all I want to know. Nothing. I don't even need prison time. I just want to know, can he still run for president? He, look, just everyone, he's he's going to be president again. <laughs> like, you no, because you think, so I'll say, well, why is he going to be president again? Well, because we live in the worst timeline. No, John, we don't live in the worst timeline. He lost in his reelection bid. There's reasons for hope. Sure, I like the idea of that. But what you don't understand is that in the worst timeline, he doesn't get elected and then get elected again. Sure, that sounds bad, but doesn't it sound worse to have a four year respite and then he gets elected again? And we'll see, we'll see. But have you noticed what Biden's up to? I looked for something optimistic or policy focused having to do with the Biden administration to cover today. Not seeing a lot. <laughs> don't know what the, I don't know. I think she just committed suicide. I'm not sure. I've been doing anyway. that. I've, I've done it like I think I've committed suicide twice, four times now. I, I apologize. Well, um, let's go to uh, lighter news, um, ridiculous news. Donald Trump is a massive power broker on the right. That's what they say, and at least in some cases, when there are contested primaries on the right, the candidates do sure seem to want his support and especially his endorsement. But that endorsement might be about to become a little bit less valuable. And not because of anything having to do with the rights attachment to Donald Trump. They still worship him as their living God emperor. No, it's that he is planning to change how he does the endorsements, specifically how many candidates he endorses in the same race. He's floated the idea of doling out dual endorsements in some of the key midterm races as he becomes increasingly suspicious of his advisors who are pushing competing candidates. One person close to Trump says he feels like he's being penned in, explaining that Trump's in the AIDS word logic is that dual endorsements would mean I get two chances to win. <laughs> well, I I guess that's true, but like I could put bets on both sides of a boxing match. I get two chances to win, but also two chances to lose. I don't know, what do you think of this idea? Him just picking like all the primary candidates? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. I guess the top two, I suppose. I mean, you know, it's a great way to just not have like a negative campaign. Nobody likes that, you know, so they'll just sort of compete and they'll work together. Um, no, it makes no sense. I think that, and, and I don't think any politician, especially a Republican, will go for that. I think the angle, if they don't get endorsed, is. Maybe to, I mean, who knows? We are, we're already seeing Rick DeSantis, or Rick DeSantis, Ron DeSantis sort of 
ruffle a little bit of MAGA feathers when it comes to whether he's vaccinated or admits he's vaccinated or not. And he's sort of like there's there's a little detente happening. So I'm curious to see how people position themselves. I mean, especially when we saw what happened in 2020, you know, like yeah. the endorsement means nothing, especially when your candidate is crap. And then you see the Yunkin um, model. Which is, I'm gonna run on something like critical race theory. I'm not gonna accept Trump's open endorsement, kind of like Trump didn't accept David Duke's open endorsement, but I'm totally gonna use the white nationalist movement slash the MAGA movement. So I don't, I almost think it's a, yeah, obviously Trump's always had the Midas touch, you know, everything um, turns to doo doo. Yeah. So, yeah, 100%. And, and look, he's had some endorsements. That have worked out. It's not the hardest thing to do if you endorse the person that's leading by a ton. Um, and by the way, it's also not difficult to make an endorsement based purely on who's leading when literally none of the candidates have any substance whatsoever and are only competing with each other during the primary season to be most deferential to Donald Trump himself. Yeah. That is pretty easy. Donald Trump's found a way to make it even easier. Just endorse a whole bunch of them and you'll always win. And while we, we, I think, this is insane and it goes against the very idea of making an endorsement. And you watching at home might say that this is laughable. You think his base is gonna think that? You think they're gonna see this for the cowardly, like smooth brained move that it is? No, <laughs> they'll be perfectly fine with it. By the way, really fast, a little spicy bit, cuz you mentioned Ron DeSantis. So him not being willing to admit that he is boosted or not before was obviously a massive weenie move when he just <laughs> sort of refused to answer the questions or was really vague in response. In the meantime, he has of course been attacked by Donald Trump, although also in a weenie move of Trump's own, not by name. For doing that, Ron DeSantis just a few days ago again refused to answer. In this case, though, saying, Well, I don't want to say that because it could be used as a weapon against me. Yes, that's true, but pointing out specifically why you're being a weenie doesn't make you less of one. It just means that you're fully aware of it. You could have written off the first comment saying, I, I thought I answered it or I wasn't sure. No, he's specifically saying, I refuse to be brave here in case someone attacks me. And that, I, like, from old school, the old school political point of view, I think makes some sense. But now, when you're going up against Donald Trump, that sort of obvious weeniehood just isn't gonna sell. How is this guy ever gonna beat Trump in an open, dirty, Trumpian fight when he yeah. can't even navigate a situation as simple as that? Here's well, the easy it, answer, just say you didn't. Whether you did or not, just lie, they don't care and they don't want you to be vaccinated. Or say you did and stand up for yourself the same way that Ted Cruz that, said that what happened on though. January 6th. But this is the thing about alpha males, right? Mm -hmm. Well. When you believe in a world of alpha males, what happens? Oh, you got one alpha male and everyone else is just a beta. Everyone else just goes along. Also sounds like authoritarianism. If there is, if you do believe in alpha dumb, then, then what does that even mean? Everyone's just deferential to Trump. So effectively, you guys are all just loser weenies that can't stand up for the things that you've already done. You already got boosted. You were saving lives, but no, 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 no. I, I mean, and and this is the point. People would rather die than get vaccinated because of Trump, right? Because yeah. of the children and the Bill Gates and the microchips and the I don't know what else, the Fauci's. Yep. Yeah, it's been true for a while. So really fast, I just want to let you know about a couple of races where this is possible that this could happen. So in Ohio. Tech billionaire uh, Peter Thiel has been lobbying Trump to pick J.D. Vance for Senate, while Kellyanne Conway has been telling him that Bernie Marino is the one that he should back. Neither candidate is a clear front runner, which presents a difficult choice. It's not clear who's gonna win. You've got advisors on both sides. I mean, I have like racked my brain to come come out like come up with a way to figure out who to endorse. But the only thing I could come up with is um, talking to the candidates and looking at their platform and choosing based on what they would do if they won. And that's not gonna happen. By the way, in Pennsylvania, Dina Powell, former White House aide, is pushing Trump to endorse her husband, David McCormick. Sean Hannity is urging him to back celebrity doctor Mehmet Oz. So this is all so like obviously biased and pointless is support from his aides. Yeah, just endorse them all, endorse everyone. In fact, endorse the Democrats too, why not? Then you can't lose.
This is, I mean, the cartoonishness of the right is like Peter Thiel encouraging to JD Vance, Sean Hannity for Dr. Oz. What world do we live in, you guys? They're literally gonna put up Mr. Potato Head as a candidate. Yeah. Mr. Potato Head will be Veep. We will be Lieutenant living, Governor. This is the Mad Lib cinematic universe. <laughs> that is what it is. It is, it is like the uh, pick proper noun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Celebrity once big in the 90s. <laughs> yeah. We need we need a new SCOTUS judge. Who are we gonna pick? Uh, that Judge Reinhold. There's just something about him that seems right for the role. Anyway, okay, we're gonna take our first break, everyone. Read some of your comments. When we come back, Sarah Palin is in two simultaneous battles, one potentially for her life. We'll give you the details after this. Okay, with that said, let's jump into the news. Sarah Palin wants to battle the New York Times, but first she has to beat another assailant, the COVID. Because the trial for Sarah Palin's defamation lawsuit against the New York Times may be delayed after the former vice presidential candidate tested positive for COVID-19. That is according to the judge overseeing her case. So she is doing this trial in federal court in Manhattan. Jed Rakoff is the US district judge in charge of it, says that she had a positive test result. So now he may choose to start proceedings on February 3rd instead of today. And the way he announced it is just great. He says, she is, of course, unvaccinated. Because, of course, she's unvaccinated. And hey, that makes her a true believer. I almost have more respect for that. Anyway, um, what is this trial about? Well, it goes way back to 2017. So she says that a 2017 New York Times editorial falsely linked her to a mass shooting in Tucson, Arizona. The editorial was published after a shooting in Alexandria, Virginia, in which Steve Scalise, a member of House Republican leadership, was wounded. And the Times said that the Tucson shooting in which six people were killed and a Democratic Congresswoman, Gabby Giffords, was severely injured, came after Palin's political action committee circulated a map putting 20 Democrats, including Giffords, under stylized crosshairs, and that the link to political incitement was clear. So this goes way back, Francesca. Yep. Do you do you actually remember the, the, the mini scandal about that Palin ad? It was a huge scandal. Yeah, it wasn't a mini scandal, it was a huge scandal. And it was one of the first moments where we saw that the, the, the base that the right was cultivating was so off their you know, stuff that, that they actually might have looked at that map, saw crosshairs and were like, yeah, I got a gun, let's go. Mm -hmm. And 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 we saw that, so it was kind of one of those moments that I think a lot of people who study, whether it's media or politics or, or or anything, or just alive and care, can point to. Okay, there is a direct consequence when you put out incendiary material like that. When you put a yeah. crosshair over someone and then you say, "Oh, I was just joking. Oh, that was just a political crosshair." So it's weird to me that Sarah Palin would almost dredge that up in 2017. Um, because it almost brings more shine and attention to what she did. Mm -hmm. That's true. Look, I I don't. I feel like maybe we'll disagree on this. I think that in theory, in a different political time, coming from a different political person representing a different political party, doing the crosshairs wouldn't necessarily be the worst thing. You're targeting the people, preferably not to be shot. But the issue is that this is America, where we take politics so seriously that many people are increasingly willing to literally murder or at least cheer the murdering of their political opponents. This is coming from a party that even before the more explicit turn to constantly invoking violence in connection with politics has made guns into their own religion. Like when you do that and you put out this message with the crosshairs to people that love guns more than literally life itself. Then that becomes more of a problem. Anyway, we might disagree, but that maybe everybody thinks it's objectively a problem. Now, um, so what is she? What is she doing? What's behind this? She objected to language that uh, James Bennett, the Times' former editorial page editor, added to a draft that had been prepared by a colleague. She contends that the added material fitted uh, Bennett's preconceived narrative, and that as an experienced editor, he knew and understood the meaning of his words. She's seeking unspecified damages. But according to court papers, has estimated four hundred and twenty-one thousand dollars in damage to her reputation. Oh come on! Is it amazing? The estimate like rounds to the thousand. That's specific. 
Yeah, it's not 430, but 421 would definitely like that's my mortgage, that's my like food costs. No, mm -hmm. this is this is what I'm saying though. It is clearly a ploy just to get some money. This has been a thing. People have written op-eds about that exact political action committee's release of that map. So to mm -hmm. finally go after somebody now for that, she just needs the money. She that's why she's doing all these appearances on cable where she like literally has no idea what's going on. She's completely yeah. out to lunch. But also the other thing about it, let's say it's not about the money. It also shows the fragility when you sue for defamation, not always, especially people in power suing for defamation. Uh, um, it often reveals that they actually uh, did something. I'm thinking of Alan Dershowitz suing one of the victims of Jeffrey Epstein oh, who accused him of of actually assault and, and of sleeping with him. So, and she, he's like, I did not, I'm going to sue you. It's like, buddy, buddy, buddy. Yeah. This make this bring way more attention on you than you really want. And I feel like the same goes for this. Yeah, maybe. Well, I would also say, look, I'm obviously not a lawyer. There are other people you can turn to on YouTube for that, I guess. Um, but anyway, uh, when you ask for $421,000 in damage to your reputation, like we talk about things like property damage. Something happens to property, you estimate how much damage. Isn't there some element of how valuable the thing was before that should be taken into account? Because this is her reputation we're talking about. Was there that much room to really damage it? By 2017, I mean, the best thing that's happened to her since then is that she was on The Masked Singer. She chose that. Did that not do damage to her reputation? Anyway, we'll leave it up to the justices. Supposedly, there is not much expectation that they will that the judge will side with her. Um, but there is this growing appetite on the right to make it easier to claim defamation. Which they think is going to be great for them. And maybe for some it will if they make that change. But they also very, very frequently lob evidence free claims against individuals and corporations at the heart of whatever conspiracy theory they came up with on the internet that week. Isn't that going to also open them up to more lawsuits? Yeah. They should be careful. Hello, Alex Jones. Opening. Exactly, exactly. Anyway, with that, let's um, mix things up in a whole bunch of different ways. Prepare yourself, let's jump into this video. What we're seeing today is what I call turnkey totalitarianism. They are putting in place all of these technical technological mechanisms for control that we've never seen before. It's been the ambition of every totalitarian state from the beginning of mankind to control every aspect of behavior, of conduct, of thought, and to obliterate dissent. None of them have been able to do it. They didn't have the technological capacity. Even in Hitler Germany, you could, you could cross the Alps into Switzerland. You can hide in an attic like Anne Frank did. That was RFK Jr. speaking at a rally that will give you more details for. I just want to um, respond a little bit to the comparison between uh, those being asked to get vaccinated or test. They always leave that part off with Anne Frank in case, uh, you know, it was a long time ago. Maybe they don't teach that anymore. Something, something critical race theory. Maybe they don't teach anything about history anymore. <laughs> Anne Frank, her mother Edith, her father Otto, and older sister Margot lived with four other Jews to hide from the Nazis in a cramped attic annex above the Amsterdam factory where her father had worked until they were discovered, arrested and sent to concentration camps. Multiple women who, who uh, survived that concentration camp and remember Anne from that time, described her in those last tragic weeks of her life as weak and emaciated, her head shaved, delirious, terrible, burning up from fever. Only Otto of the immediate family survived. So there are some differences. Between that example and the anti-vaxxers, uh, Auschwitz Memorial uh, agreed saying, exploiting uh, the tragedy of people who suffered, were humiliated, tortured and murdered by the totalitarian regime of Nazi Germany, including children like Anne Frank. In a debate about vaccines and limitations during global pandemic is a sad symptom of moral and intellectual decay. But hardly the only confirmation of that decay that we need if you're paying attention to the news every day. But what was that all about? Well, RFK Jr. was speaking at a anti-vaccine, anti-mandate demonstration that descended this weekend on a Washington. Those people were mostly maskless with some sporting far right and pro-Trump memorabilia, shockingly. 
Rally organizers predicted about 20,000 people would attend the event. The Washington Post estimated a few thousand had gathered by Sunday afternoon. Despite, by the way, the one two punch of weeks of hype on Steve Bannon's podcast, as well as guests like RFK Jr. and Laura Logan, she is still alive. She just isn't allowed on Fox News anymore. What do you think, Francesca? I mean, Again, it's this oppression fantasy that the right has. They really think it's their time. You know, they think whether it's through the vaccine, whether it's their so called decline of the white race, right? This is all about them being the real oppressed people, and they're willing to even steal the memory of the Holocaust, right? or steal the legacy of the civil rights movement in order to justify and make a comparison, a crass, disgusting comparison between what is happening now. I'm sorry, what what like what is happening now? Who are you? Are you being hauled? Are you hiding in attics? Are you being hauled away on trains? And this is again, it is it is in their mind. It is the imagination, the fantasy of what they think could maybe probably won't one day happen sort of in my dream that I had as I was trying to fall asleep, but I was too hot, you know, so I like took off the covers, but I saw it. I saw it in my mind's eye and it, and it's obviously disgusting. And you look, it wasn't just this guy talking about the comparison. You saw people holding, right? Like sort of stars of David, you know, and, yep. and as they, as they, think themselves to be the marked people, the people who are shunned, the people who there will be a Holocaust. Guess what? Almost 900,000 people have died of COVID and a lot of them are unvaccinated. And I've said this on this show before, but let's say it again. You guys are not an oppressed class, you are an elite class. Why? Because when unvaccinated people get sick, they are still being treated and cared for in hospitals. They are, everything is being done to keep them alive, to serve them. And we're staying home, people are refraining from going out and living their lives, why? Because we wanna stop the spread of the virus to largely stop also the unvaccinated all. To be honest with you, I'm more thinking about my mom, I'm thinking about older people, I'm thinking about immunocompromised people, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you guys are the ones, you're elite, you're elite. Yeah. And like, oh, I can't even, I'm just, well, so, there's so much. So elite that you know other people who need help, can't get beds in hospitals. People who need things that might not be immediate, immediately life threatening, but would very much like to have access to the healthcare system. Sorry, you're gonna have to wait a few um, few months, maybe a year, because these people really, really don't want to take medicine. Basically, that is a, a very elite position that you have, and you're totally right. It is, these are the same people that love to talk about other groups uh, engaging in the oppression Olympics. They are yes. desperately searching for some way to feel like a victim. And uh, RFK Jr. Uh, wasn't the only one. Uh, there were a number fairly deranged guests at the vaccine uh, rally that happened this weekend. Let's go to Dell Bigtree, CEO of Anti-Vax Group Informed Consent Action Network. Mark my words, we will hold Tony Fauci accountable. We will hold Deborah Brooks accountable. We will hold Joe Biden accountable. But unlike the Nuremberg trials that only tried those doctors that destroyed the lives of human beings, we are going to come after the press that lied to the world, that worked as a propaganda machine to push the. Okay, so, okay. So they're the victims in this constant Holocaust comparison that they'd like to make as he is literally saying, we're gonna hunt down the press as well as the doctors. Mm -hmm. I think you should read some books about the metaphor that you're making there. Anyway, it wasn't just him. You also had Robert Malone, the anti-vaccine doctor from Joe Rogan's podcast. He opened his speech in front of the Lincoln Memorial by invoking Martin Luther King Jr's speech. Uh, adding that anti-vax marchers in DC today are quote, standing on the shoulders of giants. Sort of, I mean, you're kind of standing on a needless mountain of American dead from the pandemic that didn't need to die. But thank you for your contributions to that human suffering. You also had regular people, of course. John Copel, a staunch advocate against COVID-19 vaccines and an InfoWars loyalist told the Daily Beast ahead of the rally, he's a fan of Alex Jones. Well, wouldn't you have to be to be a loyalist to InfoWars anyway? He carried a sign that promoted Jones media entity and claimed that Dr. Fauci is a mass murderer. He said he remains upset with former President Donald Trump's initial push of what he calls 
the bioweapon. The rally goer added that Trump's endorsement of the vaccine is a serious issue. We are for medical freedom, he continued, before suggesting that Trump might have been corrupted. So we've seen this little dance where they love Trump, they really love Trump, but he'll encourage them to take this a little bit seriously, maybe get vaccinated and they boo him. If they're put to a test, some of them, perhaps an increasing number, they know which they would choose. They like this new identity they have more than the Trump stuff, perhaps because of the rhetoric is even more deranged, even more apocalyptic. The conspiracy theory more pure and undiluted than Donald Trump's rambling diatribes. Absolutely, and I think you're gonna see, look, that was the who's who of anti-vax influencers who have been doing this grift for decades. And the pandemic and the vaccine rollout was a perfect trifecta plus MAGA folks for a lot of these influencers and wellness gurus and people who just sell you more snake oil. But maybe they do it from like an alternative medicine position or from like a family based or like I am a sovereign autonomous being, right? <laughs> like what is called conspirituality, which by the way, everyone should listen to that podcast, it's amazing. Um, that they are going to be more and more of these people, not just out in front, they're gonna run for office, y'all. And so I think yeah. it is important, what can we do? It's very scary, for me, it comes down to public health and Medicare for all. The more, the more easily accessible your doctor is to you, your healthcare plans are to you, the more affordable, uh, the more clinics there are, um, the more we can dispel and turn to places like YouTube, which should not be places yeah. where you get your like your information. You should not be turning to the Joe Rogan podcast to tell you the truth, right? But that's sort of what we have sown in this country and we're reaping it and it is scary, but like, please try and pull your friends away from the brink of this. Um, however you can, because a lot of people are getting sucked into the anti-vax world and it's not just from the yeah. right, it's also from the so-called progressive left. Yeah, or or you're totally right, um, especially because that's where the money is. If you're gonna yes. make like, by the way, I've made what a thousand videos cautioning people about the pandemic and trying to get them take them to get them to take it seriously. Let me tell you, it's not a big money maker, but pushing ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine and conspiracy theories, massive money. You can get a nice house on that money. It turns out. Or John, if but you anyway. title your video Dr. Fauci, if you criticize Dr. Fauci in a headline, which he deserves some criticism, that'll get clicks. Anything. Oh, so, oh, totally, and just, just do that all day long. And sure, yep. people won't know what's going on. They won't be ready to engage with the political system, but you will be wealthy. Um, there's also regular, like they would maybe describe themselves as centrist, but like longtime Democrats who are at this rally. Claire Tobin is a lifelong Democratic voter from Chicago. She voiced her frustrations with politicians pushing mandates and vaccines. I don't trust the vaccine. You can't even trust the Democrats either. They all have the same message. They all had the same agenda. Which look, obviously them all having the same message on the pandemic doesn't seem true. But it might be a little bit harder for them to say it's all equal if one party got the presidency and then accomplished a lot of stuff. Joe Biden, that might help to differentiate the two. Mm -hmm. um, one attendee, to give you an idea of how rampant the conspiracy theories are, he said his name is Jason, told the Daily Beast the event might be a psyop. Due to the loud rap music being blared through speakers, which prohibited attendees from talking to each other. It's a disaster, no one can talk to each other. You realize this, there are always operations. It, oh. No, it's they're incompetent and so they put the audio up too loud. It's not the CIA necessarily. And of course, crazy signs, shoot those who try to kidnap and vaccinate your child, stuff like that. <laughs> My producer says, what if he's a surgeon and he just got paged mid, mid quote? Well, apparently he's uh, he should probably go back to that because uh, people need the help, we need the doctors. <sighs> anyway, okay, everybody, uh, we're gonna take one more break. We come back, SCOTUS uh, ready to potentially remove another thing. One of the minimal government changes over the past few decades to make things a little bit more equal. We'll have details on that and more after this. Okay, the hour is rapidly burning up. Let's jump into our last two stories. The, I know, I, I would prefer for her to do the intros too, I get it. The director's <laughs> got a favorite, can you guess who it is? What am I, Don Jr. and she's Ivanka? Give me a chance, yes. Dad, I can do it. <laughs> anyway. 
By the way, Eric is nowhere in this. He's one of the heads of the Trump organization. Trump don't care. Anyway, neither does the January 6th commission. Anyway, <laughs> okay, now it's me time and we're gonna talk about something. The Supreme Court has been on a tear, getting ready to tear up all of your constitutional rights, having to do with reproductive rights and a number of other things. Well, they've got another issue area in their sights because the Supreme Court this week announced that they are going to take up and hear a challenge to the consideration of race in college admissions, so-called affirmative action. They are now coming for it. The court said it will take up lawsuits claiming that Harvard University, a private institution, and the University of North Carolina, a state school, discriminate against Asian American applicants. A decision against the schools could mean the end of affirmative action in college admissions. Lower courts have already rejected those challenges, citing more than 40 years of high court rulings that allow colleges and universities to consider race and admissions decisions. But that's just like precedent or something mm -hmm. for like a half century. We didn't get a conservative supermajority in the SCOTUS to abide by precedent. And so Francesca, um, these right wingers, uh, I, I'm gonna guess 98% of whom are white that are behind this, are very worried about discrimination against Asian American college applicants. What do you think? I mean, this court is so radical uh, that it basically plucks anything out of the lower courts that's already been decided a million times and elevates it so long as it seems to uh, obliterate uh, any kind of, um, I don't know, like democratic uh, norms or uh, rights of like like anti-discrimination laws. I mean, I I'm, I'm wouldn't be surprised if they pluck up like a property dispute between like Brett Kavanaugh's uncle and his neighbor about which side <laughs> the pomegranate tree is on. And they're like, this needs to be in the Supreme Court. Yes, and I rule that that pomegranate tree is on Uncle Kavanaugh. Like that is <laughs> what they're doing. Um, yep. Now, there has been, a long, I mean, I think it's a really interesting discussion, but really the what they're doing is essentially allowing for affirmative action to go away, right? They want it gone and they want um, the any kind of attempt to correct historical inequity um, and crimes of the past, i.e. legacies of slavery and Jim Crow in this country. Um, Inability to access higher education. They want that yeah. all gone because that's all that's all critical race theory. That's all done. Right. And I think Asian Americans are a good sort of Trojan horse to basically say, well, see, they're people of color too. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And uh and 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 again, Asian Americans in America in the United States are often seen as, as this model minority. And there is a ton of racism within Asian the Asian American community and with other communities um, against Black Americans. Again, a lot of this has to do with just bottom line yeah. anti-Blackness. So let's not 100%. forget that. Yeah, no, uh, uh, totally. And by the way, how might this go? Because just because they're they're talking about it doesn't mean that they're going to overturn it. Well, the court's most recent pronouncement was back in 2016, a 4-3 decision upholding the admissions program at the University of Texas against a challenge brought by a white woman. But the composition of the court has changed since then. Two members mm -hmm. of the four justice majority are gone from the court. Just Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died in 2020. Anthony Kennedy retired two years prior. The three dissenters in the case remain on the court. And then there's other justices that have come since then, but I, I'm not sure which way they'll go. I don't know. <laughs> so I will end with a poll. Um, the fact that affirmative action might soon be gone, that your reproductive rights might be Thanos. Um, is the Supreme Court something to consider on the Supreme on uh, during elections or to not consider during elections? Mm -hmm. We got an A and a B. We'll give you the results after the next presidential election. Anyway, um, with that, we are very, very quick to running out of this hour. So uh, perhaps we can uh, jump to our last story. We're gonna start with this video. No room to yell at us. I wanna speak to the person who made this train. Is that you? No, well, it wasn't We don't know me. who made it, so. You don't know who made it? There's four of us here, so we obviously don't. Stupid ignorant high school kids. Okay, bye. I wanna speak to the Bye, okay, you can call corporate or whatever you want, goodbye. Jam stop. Give it to me right now. Yeah. What? Oh, I'm calling the police. I'm calling the police. I want the telephone. Janice, I want the telephone. Get out. You call for me. Bye. Okay, good for you. Bye. I want the
immigrant loser. What? Get the Get the out! Get the You're going to jail! You're going to jail, you racist piece <laughs> Bro, call the police now. So that was uh, obviously male Karen at a Robex in Fairfield, which is actually right next door to Bridgeport, Connecticut, where I uh, was uh, born and raised. James Iannazzo was apparently so angry with the employees of a Robex that he uh, yelled at them, threw stuff, shouted racial slurs. And then yes, at the end of the video, tried to get into the employees only area, which is suspicious. In any event at a Robex, uh, but particularly after you're yelling and shouting racist stuff, I would have been terrified if I was one of those teenagers working at that Robex that this madman was going to attack. So I'll give you more details about what led to that, but I, but I do want your your reaction, Francesca. Um, I mean, Ida Rola, yeah, not so. I think there's some uh, go get your Close. boyness over here, uh, Connecticut John. Uh, call your boy. But I, now, to be fair. I look, I've never uh, been arrested while at a Robex. I've been thrown out of a Robex <laughs> and I am banned from several Papa John's. Or sorry, Papa's John, I think it would be called. <laughs> um, but this is not the same thing, Comet with the anti Italian stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. And that's fine. No, um, my first thought when I saw this is beyond his ridiculous behavior because we've seen this so much lately, but it's about the workers, right? They're you know, I just did a, like a whole two hours on like the the Great Resignation um, on the Twituation Room, which is my TYT stream. But like, there are so many workers who are saying, "Enough! I don't get paid to deal with these customers and to be mistreated and to have drinks thrown at me." Right? This is not even a minimum wage job. We can't even get the minimum wage raised. Meanwhile, my shifts are disappearing. I, you know, I don't get sick time. Whatever it is, like. These no worker deserves to be treated that way, and it's on management to to, to protect them. So yeah. I immediately just thought, man, I would quit. To, like I would quit. Like, mm -mm. yeah, I would look working in these sorts of jobs. I'm sure you have. I've worked in a thousand different areas of food service and retail and all that. It was never easy. And these things, by the way, are not totally new. What's new is high definition cameras being carried around by everyone. But they are worse. People do feel emboldened, I think. In this case, he says the reason, because he's now got a lawyer, he's been arrested and all that, is that he had gotten a smoothie, given it to his child. The child had had an allergic reaction. He believes that they put peanuts in it or something like that that caused it. Uh, I understand that that would cause you to be very angry and very scared. I understand that. And I admit that Robex is a high tension area in the best of times. Everyone's hopped up on stimulants and stuff. Um, but you don't get to to try to attack them, like especially verbally in a racial way and especially potentially physically trying to what, what were you what were you gonna say to them in the employee only area that you couldn't say over the counter? Why did you need to try to bust down a door that a scared employee is desperately trying to keep shut? That is horrifying behavior. And the context about the, the health thing does not ameliorate it. Yeah. Yeah, and and I know he's got like a statement out, and and he's, you know, he works with Merrill Lynch, right? It, it's just it doesn't matter what happened. The way that you treat someone, it says everything about your worldview too. Like if you're treating, I mean, again, like we all know that the way that you treat um, the way that you treat working people, the, like we've all been out to dinner with somebody who like treats like uh, you know wait staff like crap. Mm -hmm. they're, it's, a, it's they're ridiculous, and it shows a lot about their worldview and how they believe workers should be in the service of them. And if they make any kind of mistake, well, then they deserve to have a smoothie thrown at them and be berated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Instead of you know, I'm sure if he was yeah. calmer about it, the whole situation would have been calmer. Yeah, definitely. And then he might not have ended up getting arrested and he might not have uh, to add just one little bit of extra news what you said about the Merrill Lynch thing. He used to work at Merrill Lynch, he does not work there anymore. Because apparently there is actually a line, even for organizations like that. Not having to do with the financial stuff, but when it comes to Robux, they take that seriously. Anyway, um, okay, with that, we've still got a lot more planned. If you're on a linear platform, uh, thank you for watching. We will see you tomorrow. But if you're on Twitch or on YouTube, the members app, those sorts of things, Francesca and I have got a lot to talk about still, including litter box drama, as well as news from around the world in Meanwhile In. We'll be right back.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.